Hi, my name is Kalyan Nandipadi. I'm one of the surgeons at Creighton University Medical Center, part of a bariatric program. I would like to give you some introduction and facts about morbid obesity. Morbid obesity has been a rampant epidemic in the United States in the last 20 years. If you look at this, some of these pictures that are starting from 1990, in 1990, this is the initial picture, we classify BMI more than 30 as being overweight. And there are some dark blues, there are some white color, and also there are some light blue on this slide. The dark blue indicates to more than 10% of these states are overweight. You can see in 1990 itself, more than 50% of the states has overweight people more than 10%. Imagine if you can fast forward it to 16 years, which we have it right now. In 2006, the number of people whose BMI is more than 30 is increased to more than 30%. And if you look at the dark red color in these slides, there are some states of more than 30% of their population. And there are some which has more than 25% of the populations are morbidly obese. That means BMI more than 30. And in 2007, at least 30% of our population itself are overweight. This is a significant problem which has been increasing in the last 20 years. So more than 50% rise in obesity trends in the past decade and nearly two-thirds of Americans are overweight at this point of the time. More than 11.5 million Americans are morbidly obese in 2007. The number is still increasing. Morbid obesity has increased fourfold from 1986 to 2000 and twofold from 2000 to 2006. So it took 14 years for it to go to fourfolds, but it took only two years for it to double. And it took, next, it took only four more years to double it more than what we have right now. The healthcare cost because of morbid obesity is tremendous. It is estimated that more than 230 billion healthcare dollars goes directly in treating morbid obesity problems. Not only morbid obesity itself, the problem associated with morbid obesity. This is a significant healthcare expenditure. And if you look at the problems throughout the worldwide, it has actually replaced the smoking as a number one preventable cause in, in the United States. So, morbid obesity is a significant problem and you are not alone. It almost one third of American population has this similar problem at present time. It's not only in the United States, it's a global healthcare problem. Throughout the world, almost 10% of the worldwide population are overweight and going into morbid obesity. So what are the problems associated with morbid obesity? Is 400,000 deaths annually in 2005, and it's only second only to the preventable causes other than smoking. It increases your chance of dying four times than the normal weight populations. If you are obese with BMI of more than 30, there is a 50% chance of increase in your death. And if your BMI is more than 40, what we call it as class three or morbid obesity, there is a 90% increase in cardiovascular incidence and death. This is a significant issue in terms of morbidity and mortality. So in 2010 and 2011, treating and preventing the morbid obesity has been a significant problem for the healthcare and health for the hospitals. It is also an important issue as a patient, you should also be known about your future risk and importance of losing weight, which can decrease your morbidity and mortality in the down the road. Coming to the etiology of the obesity, the, there are numerous causes of obesity, most of them are unknown. If you have a parents, both are morbidly obese, 
there is 90% chance that you can have morbid obesity, implicating there is a genetic factors which plays important role in development of morbid obesity. There are several other explanations, decrease in the expenditure of energy with more sedentary lifestyle, and also increasing consumption of excess calorie diet, increasing consumption of excess, excess fatty foods. There are some psychological disorders where patients tend to eat more. It's called as excessive binge eating. These are the eating disorders. And also people who are under stress tend to gain more weight. And also people under stress has a higher chance of being morbid obese in the future times. These are some of the causes of obesity but often then, the main reason for morbid obesity is not known. The treatment options currently include medical management and surgical management. Medical management precedes the surgical treatment options. Medical management will be covered by my partner, Dr. Armour Force, in the next few slides. I'll take you through the different surgical options and preparation for the surgical options in the next few slides. Currently, we have four different surgical options available. All of them are done laparoscopically more than 90% of the times. The treatment options include laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, laparoscopic gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, piliopancreatic diversion, which is also called as duodenal switch. Let's go through the, what is the standard criteria for bariatric surgery? Currently, the NIH consensus are if your body mass index, which is more than 40, we also call it as class 3 obesity, or if your body mass index more than 35, and also have morbid obesity associated comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, sleep apnea. Before going for surgery, you do have to have shown that you have failed medical management and you have a stable psychological profile and you don't have any eating disorders. The preoperative preparation consists of complete medical workup, workup of comorbidities and control of those comorbidities which include diabetes, sleep apnea and hypertension before going through the operation. We would like to advise you to stop smoking for at least three months before the operation as it's shown to decrease the morbidity after the procedure. Try to increase your activity going into your operation as it can decrease your morbidity and also increases your recovery. It is also important to lose weight going into your operation. It helps in the procedure itself. Weight loss before the operation actually decreases your liver size which help us in performing the procedure easily. Nutritional counseling and changing eating habits behavior is most important going into your surgery because this is once in a lifetime chance for you to get better. So to understand the role of surgery, we wish to first go over some of the other options known as the medical treatment of your condition, obesity. Uh, often referred to as class 3 or greater obesity. On this slide, we just briefly touch on some of the elements with regard to medical treatment of your obesity. Diet, which I'm sure many of you have tried, has problems in terms of the amount of weight that one can lose, as well as the duration of that weight control. Less than 5% of people with your degree of obesity can control their weight with a diet. Exercise by itself is extremely hard to use to control weight and is really only seen as a lifestyle change to help with health maintenance. Medications have been around for a while and while they have some excitement in terms of the data that they present, they only usually get 5 to 10 percent of weight loss. The additional problem with medications is that when the medications are stopped, the weight is usually regained. On this slide, which represents a graft or table from a paper, 
reviewed a number of the medications that are used. What I have done is circled in red the percentage of weight lost with these medications compared to placebo, or as we usually refer to them as the sugar pills. One can see that across the range of medications, the patients only lost from 3 to 5 percent of their weight with these medications. In terms of the weight loss that you would like to lose, this is insignificant and is not to the degree that you would want or need. On the next slide, we talk about behavioral therapy. This is important, part of our lifestyle changes, but in its own right, it is not as effective in terms of weight management. How about using them all together? That's the diet, and exercise, behavioral therapy, and let's even add in the medications. The overall performance for the amount of weight that you would tend to lose and the long-term success with this is again poor at less than 10%. On the next slide is an attempt to try to put this together for us. Now the treatments are listed on one side of the slide and then across the top of the slide we see progressive increases in one's weight as represented by the body mass index. The treatments are those what we consider medical treatments down to the drug treatments and also the surgery. For those with just mild weight, the treatment is lifestyle changes in diet, and there that is usually successful. As our weight increases to body mass indexes of 30, which we consider obesity, we see that we not only have to use the lifestyle changes, but now we add in the pharmacy or the pharmatherapy, that's the medications. Finally, as we see the weight get higher, to the BMIs of 35 and finally greater than 40, the recommendations are not only the lifestyle and diet changes, attempts at medications, but now there is a role for surgery. The reason for this is that the success of the medical management, that's in terms of the diet, lifestyle changes, behavioral therapy, is inadequate by itself, and this leads us to have to look to surgery to help add in additional treatment to get control of our weight. In trying to help us decide on what to do, I am putting together two slides that represent two studies, one from the United States of America and the other from Sweden. The first slide is a study comparing patients who were given medical therapy but no surgery, the no surgery group, and a group that underwent bariatric surgery. The slide shows us the mortality or those that died over 15 years during this study. For patients of all ages, those who use medical therapy had a 16.3% mortality rate, which is extremely high. This was reduced in all ages down to 11.8% with the surgery, showing the significant improvement that surgery added to the treatment of these patients and their obesity. What is far more exciting is those patients under 40 years of age, those who had medical therapy only, had a mortality rate of 13.8%, which was extremely high. However, those who had the surgery had a mortality rate down to 3%, which is a mortality rate that is comparable to patients who are under 40 and who are not obese. This strongly supports the use of surgery terms of the treatment of this degree of obesity. On the next slide is the work that was done in Sweden in a fairly comparable trial or study. Again, we see across the bottom of the slide the number of years that they followed them, that's up to 16 years, and we see the cumulative mortality or death rate for the patients. We see with the control group, those patients who had medical therapy, that their mortality rate is up to 12 to 13 percent. This is a mortality rate that was comparable to patients who were morbidly obese using medical therapy in the United States. Those who underwent the surgery had a significant decrease in their mortality rate, almost halving it, bringing it down to about 7 percent. Thus again we see the role of surgery significantly improving these patients' mortality rate 
above the medical therapy that they had received. This strongly supports the role of surgery as a treatment option for your obesity. Gastric banding and sleeve gastrectomy works by restrictive mechanism by limiting the amount that you can eat and also producing an early satiety and fullness. Gastric bypass and biliopancreatic diversion works by the both mechanisms. One is restrictive by limiting the amount that you can eat and also the second one is malabsorptive. That means not allowing everything that you eat going into your bloodstream. Gastric banding is the second most commonly performed weight loss operation at present time. The adjustable gastric band placed on the upper part of your stomach to create a small 40 to 60 cc of your pouch. The band is sutured around the stomach and it is connected to a tubing to a port. The port is placed under the skin and it can be accessed every month. Each and every month when you come to the office or in the radiology, we will access the port with a needle and fill the band with saline solution. By filling the gastric band, it decreases the lumen of your stomach and increases your restriction. After three to four or sometimes up to six fills, people get to a spot where they are happy with the weight loss and also happy with the amount of restriction they have. With the gastric band, there are certain facts that you need to be known before you consider this option. The benefits of the operation, it limits the amount of food that you can eat, it is easier to perform, and has less complication rate. It is not associated with any vitamin deficiencies, and it is not associated with any protein malabsorption. It can be reversible. On the other hand, you should also be aware of the complications of the gastric banding. Let's talk about gastric bypass now. This is the most commonly performed weight loss operation currently in the United States and also throughout the world wide. It has the longest history of success story with the weight loss more than 60 to 80 percent of your excess body weight over a period of five to eight years. As shown in this slide, gastric bypass is created by creating a small pouch in the upper part of your stomach. Once we divide the stomach, into two parts, which has a small 15 to 20 cc of pouch, which is connected to a small intestine to bypass the proximal small intestine. So if you look at this picture, the, the food that you're going to eat, going to into the gastric pouch, then goes through the proximal small bowel, which is being bypassed, leaving a less small bowel for your absorption. So this creates a segment of malabsorption, which increases the weight loss percentage. But however, this is associated with all the other complications of weight loss. Let's talk about the benefits and disadvantages of ruined by gastric bypass. Benefits are, this has the longest follow-up in the literature with the longest success story, and decreases the amount of food that you can eat and it decreases the amount of food that is going to be absorbed into the, your body. It produces satisfactory weight loss with a weight loss ranging from 60 to 80 percent of your excess body weight in first two years. It is also reversible in people who has complications and who are not happy with the weight loss. The problems with the gastric bypass are it can be associated with leaks, although incidence of leaks are less than one percent and we do test in the operating room to make sure there are no leaks. There are some other complications like internal hernias, vitamin deficiencies can happen on a long-term basis. This highlights the importance that you should be on the lifelong vitamin supplementation and should be following up with a primary care physician or a bariatric surgeon for the rest of your life. There is a chance about 5% of the people probably don't lose any weight. This is, we call it as failure of weight loss after gastric bypass. Although the numbers are small, but it still can happen. Now let's talk about the general complications associated with any bariatric procedure. In the previous sections, you have seen the complications associated with individual procedures. In this slide, as you notice, there are some general complications which can be associated with any bariatric procedure, which include complications like pneumonia, 
complications like wound infection. These are the few important things which you should be aware of before considering for any bariatric procedure. Early mobilization in the hospital and with improvement in this technique has actually decreased the complications rate associated with any bariatric procedure. Overall, the morbidity and mortality associated with these bariatric procedures is very low. In the recent literature, the mortality after any bariatric procedure is considered less than 1% with improvement in the anesthesia technique and the supportive care. If you look at this slide, the top line which outlines the mortality rate with all the procedures, you can note the mortality rate is less than 1% with any procedure. The morbidity is variable. The gastric band associated with least morbidity, the PPD associated with highest morbidity. The gastric sleeve and gastric bypass are in between. However, the decision to undergo any procedure should be taken into account of your risks and also of your benefits. Bariatric procedure is not only to lose weight, but also to have improvement in comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, and sleep apnea. In the next slide outlines the benefits associated with each and every procedure. This is the slide that's showing in the each and every procedure category which has more than 1,000 patients and it, it shows you, outlines you the BMI change. The gastric band has a BMI change of 10 with the BPD being the highest and the gastric bypass has been the closest with 17. The percentage of the improvement is maximum with gastric bypass and with BPD in terms of diabetes, which is more than 80% to 90%, in terms of hypertension, which has a success rate of more than 75%, and in sleep apnea, which more than 80% of the people will have resolution of these comorbidities. It is important for you to decide which procedure is right for you depending upon your comorbidities also. The gastric bypass and BPD has definitely shown to have a higher resolution rate in your comorbidities compared to the gastric banding. On this slide is a picture of what we call a sleeve gastrectomy. This is an operation that we refer to as restrictive. That is, it's designed to limit the food that you can take into your stomach. The stomach is created in a long cylinder shape like a long banana. The majority of the stomach has been excised. The conduit or long cylinder has a control valve at the front end and the back end of the stomach, thus allowing the stomach to fundamentally function as normal. This is a relatively new operation, but we have seen some excellent results with it. On the next slide, we outline for you the benefits and the disadvantages of this operation. The benefits of the operation is it limits the food that you take in. It has relatively few complications. There is less dumping. That's a problem where the food leaves quickly and makes you sick. Less vitamin deficiencies. Less problems with protein malnutrition, a very important part of bariatric surgery. And it's very effective at decreasing the appetite. The reason it does this is that the large portion of the stomach that was removed removes a hormone we call ghrelin, which affects your appetite. Again, by removing the stomach, we remove the ghrelin, which decreases your appetite, an extremely important aspect of this surgery. The disadvantages to the operation are that there are technical problems, such as a dehiscence of the stomach. This is where the stomach comes apart from all the suturing, but this is extremely rare. There are problems with leaks and fistulas, but again, these are reportedly very few. Patients can develop ulcers, but for the most part, these are mild and can be treated medically. There are problems with esophageal reflux, which is when food will come back up into the esophagus. This problem seems to settle down over time, but can be a residual problem that is an issue for patients. We have also seen problems with esophageal motility this is where contractions of the esophagus are altered and leads to, again, problems of reflux. It is a newer procedure, which means we don't have long-term data on its success, 
and what's extremely important, it is irreversible. That is, once we've removed your stomach, we cannot replace it. On the next slide is perhaps the most complex and advanced surgery that we have for bariatric surgeries, the biliopancreatic diversion with a duodenal switch. This slide depicts the operation and looks rather complex. The first part you'll see is that there is a stomach that looks the same as a sleeve gastrectomy. That's because it is. So the first part of this operation is to create a sleeve gastrectomy whereby we move most of your stomach. The two valves of the stomach are in place and it operates much as the sleeve gastrectomy does. The intestine, however, is also altered in this operation. It is what we refer to as a distal bypass and so we are bypassing the intestine very low down. This creates a high degree of malabsorption. The bypass segment of intestine is then connected to the duodenum or the outlet of the stomach. This then creates a system that limits the food intake because you have a sleeve gastrectomy. But in addition to that, the low bypass or the long segment bypass results in significant degrees of malabsorption, which together is very effective in controlling weight. On the next slide, we outline the good and the bad of this operation. The benefits are that patients can eat a relatively large amount of food compared to the other restrictive operations. There are less liver problems associated with this operation, liver problems that we have had before with high degrees of malabsorption. There is less severe diarrhea, although diarrhea still can persist. Again, there is limited amount of dumping that leads to this diarrhea. There is excellent weight loss results. It's some of the best weight loss results that we see with the operations, and this weight loss is maintained, so we see less late weight gain. The disadvantages to the operation are again several. They're related to the gastrectomy and also to the malabsorption. Patients can develop stomal ulcers. These are a type of ulcer that again requires medical treatment and for the most part we are successful in controlling that. Patients get steatorrhea, which is a medical word for fat malabsorption and patients as a result of this can have loose stools with foul smelling. They can develop cholelithiasis, that is that patients because of the amount of weight they lose and how fast they lose the weight can develop gallstones, which will require them to have their gallbladder removed. Many of us will propose to the patient that if you choose this operation, that we'll remove your gallbladder at the same time to prevent this complication. Flatus is gas that we uh, pass, and it is a side effect, most commonly due to the patients not eating properly with this operation, but it can be a significant problem. Because of the malabsorption, patients can develop protein malnutrition, which can be present in up to 21%. That's 20 patients, 21 patients out of 100 that can develop this, requiring us to add more protein to our diet. In fact, patients may need to take protein supplements because this is so severe. Patients are prone to anemia, meaning that the hemoglobin or blood counts are low, and there are several causes for that related to this operation. The operation's uh, malabsorption is the main reason. Supplements, again, can successfully treat this. Vitamin deficiencies such as calcium and metabolic bone disease are more prevalent with this operation, again, related to the malabsorption. This requires us to be very vigilant with our patients, and all of these vitamin and protein problems require patients come in frequently with this operation to have their blood levels checked. Many of the patients as a result of this are on supplements. Again, very importantly, because we remove part of the stomach, this operation is considered irreversible and cannot be changed back. We want to first thank you very much for choosing us to be involved in your care. We know that this is an extremely important decision that you are making 
and we respect you for doing that. We also empathize with the difficulties that you've gone through with your obesity. We are very excited about the opportunity to care for you and to find the right solution for you. We hope that this tape has been helpful for you in learning about your options. We look forward to guiding you to make the right decision and look forward to a long relationship with you as we find a way for you to lose your weight, gain your health, and your happiness.